I, um, well, actually, I wanted to ask, uh, were any of you aware of the fact that uh, this summer was the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing? How many of you w either went to an event or at least watched something on TV about it? A, a good number of people here. And I know that for uh, those of you who are students, oh, one, one uh, thing I forgot to mention, if you are a student and are attending and uh, need a stamp for um, credit, there will be people outside the hallway, in, in the atrium afterwards, uh, who will you know, stamp your notes. Uh, but so if you're you know, one of the uh, students, you're, you may be thinking, you know, this, this was like ancient history uh, 50 years ago. But actually, as we'll find out tonight, um, if you return samples, it actually, the mission doesn't end when the, when the astronauts return and uh, you know, get out of quarantine. Um, so our speakers tonight is uh, Dr. Jessica Barnes. Uh, Jessica, Jessica got her undergraduate degree at the University of St. Andrews in uh, Scotland, and then got her PhD from Open University in the UK. Um, Dr. Barnes uh, has just joined our faculty officially about a month ago, I believe. Um, a month ago tomorrow, yeah. So she's sort of getting accustomed to Tucson, but I think uh, you'll be fascinated by the things she has to say about uh, the moon. Dr. Dr. Barnes. Okay, just, can everyone hear me? Just bear with me one second. Technology. Okay. Scotland, if anyone wants to go. Advertisement. <laughs> okay. So, brilliant. Okay, so I just wanted to iterate um, what Tim said, which is thank you so much, everyone, for coming. This is a great crowd. Oh, lighter there. Can everyone hear me? No? Okay. Maybe I'll just move this around. Let's see. Is that better? Well, okay, I'm going to try not to shout into it. Just let me know. I appreciate it if you just let me know if you can't hear me. I'm going to start a timer as well so I don't run way over and we're here at midnight. Okay, so as Tim, as Tim kind of alluded to, sample return missions um, are basically the gift that keeps on giving. And that's certainly true for the Apollo missions. Um, I wasn't around when the Apollo missions collected these amazing samples, but I am one of you know, many fortunate people who get to study them. And so tonight I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the geological history of the moon from the perspective, oh, this is not working, from the perspective of, um, we'll just go with it like this. Can you see? No, okay. We're going to wing it. It's okay. So. Uh, from the geological history of both Apollo samples that have kind of been available for study over the last 50 years, as well as a new group of samples that have just become available for study, and I'll explain more about that um, as we go on in the talk. And so, kind of the way the talk is uh, framed, um, I'm going to start by talking about Apollo samples in general. And then I'm going to focus on two particular science nuggets that have come out of um, studying Apollo samples. So things that have really changed our appreciation of how the moon formed and evolved geologically. Um, and then I'm going to start talking about what are termed specially curated Apollo samples. And these are essentially uh, new lunar samples because they've never been studied. And so we're going to talk a bit about that and how LPL and my group is involved in, in looking at those new samples. Um, and then I'll focus more on the planned work. And you'll understand as we go through the talk why it's planned and it's not ongoing just yet. And so I wanted to start off by, because I can see looking out into the crowd that there, are, you know, we have um, a large range of experiences, or um, I didn't want to say ages, but there we go. Uh, we have a diverse audience. And so in case you're not familiar, there have been many uh, landed or lunar lander missions. So we're not just talking here about uh, missions that collected samples, 
but missions that physically successfully landed on the surface of the moon. <laughs> and unfortunately, you'll see that the Indian uh, Space Agency ISRO mission that was supposed to land a couple of weeks ago um, on, in the South Pole is not there because it unfortunately didn't make it, which is very sad. Um, but we have a, a whole host of successful missions from different nations. And on the right side of the screen, you see Apollo 11 through 17. Those are our sample return missions, and those are going to be the ones that I'm going to focus on today. Um, but just wanted to highlight uh, two things. First, there are three uh, uh, lunar missions, so Russian-Soviet missions, that collected samples as well from the moon. I'm not going to talk about those today, um, but just to make you aware that it's not just the NASA's and US's um, Apollo sample collection that is available. Uh, sorry, three things. The second thing is that we also have lunar meteorites. Again, I'm not really going to focus on those either. Um, and the third thing is, um, this picture is the near side of the moon. So the, the, the face of the moon that, that, sees that, that we see from Earth. And all of the uh, Apollo and Luna samples that we have in terrestrial and Earth-based collections are collected from this side of the moon. So there's a whole other side to the moon that we don't have uh, samples that we have gone and collected or have been collected by robots. So that's just more of an FYI. Okay, so Apollo samples. So... The Apollo missions that landed on the moon, there were six that successfully landed and collected samples. As I said, they collected samples from the near side of the moon. And they collected and successfully returned 382 kilograms of material. And that material is stored, it's carefully curated, carefully looked after um, at uh, NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And currently there are, well, there are, uh, just under 2,200 samples. So those are samples that have individual names and have been uh, yeah, individually characterized. And as you can see from this figure, uh, or figures, there's a whole host of different types of samples. So we have volcanic material. So the top left, you see a, a very um, uh, gray looking rock <laughs> with lots of holes in it. So volcanic rock, I'll explain more, uh, a bit more about the textures um, and form of that rock later. Um, we have a material that is formed from a magma that didn't erupt onto the surface, so um, still magmatic, but intruded into the crust. And again, I'll explain more about that later. And that's a plutonic sample from Apollo 17. Um, we also have what's called an anorthosite. We have material that's formed by impact processes, so asteroids um, and uh, extra lunar material hitting the surface of the moon. Um, and forming the large and very prominent impact structures that we see on the surface of the moon today. And they basically churn up lots of material from the local area and also much further afield and create these samples that are basically a hodgepodge of lots of different uh, types of rocks and soils and uh, melt and all different kinds of things. And so those are our breaches. But then we have a whole host of soils that were scooped from the, the, the surface of the moon. We have core samples. Um, if you didn't know, we have cores were taken on the surface of the moon, and also drive tubes, and I'll explain a lot more about that later. And the key thing is that these samples, uh, more than 84% of the samples that we were retained or returned from the Apollo missions, more than 84% of those remain in their pristine condition, so have not been taken out and, and, and studied uh, in large part. That's not to say they haven't been studied, because a large portion of those um, have sister samples or subsamples that have been studied, so we know what the material's made of. It's just to say a lot of the material still remains to be studied and looked at and is available for study. And so um, I mentioned that Apollo samples are really the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, and one important thing that we learned from Apollo and from these samples is actually the evolutionary history of the moon. So prior to Apollo, some people, including the very prominent Harold Urey, kind of postulated and um, believed that the moon was essentially an undifferentiated body, that it was kind of similar to primitive uh, chondritic material, that it wouldn't have had lavas on it, that um, it wasn't separated into a core mantle and crust like the Earth is. Um, but what quickly became apparent, especially or even as early as Apollo 11, is that, um, I wish I had a pointer, uh, I'm just going to reach, 
So even Apollo 11 soils, you could see and tease out, um, and John Wood was um, the person who basically kicked this all off, um, that there are white fragments in basically a dark uh, matrix of, of uh, basaltic rock and soils and glasses. And there are these white fragments. And those white fragments, as many of you probably know, are um, a mineral called anorthite, which is a calcium aluminum silicate. Um, and whereas uh, uh, it's very prominent and very commonly occurring on the moon, it's not actually, oh, thank you so much. I was going to have to dance around a lot tonight. OK, so there we go. Um, and so whereas this mineral is very prominent in lunar samples, it's actually kind of rare on Earth. Um, we don't find it in large swaths in large regions on Earth, only in particular uh, settings like layered intrusions. And so one thing that John Wood, as early as 1970, so these samples were collected in 1969, and as early as 1970, he made kind of the bold statement that in order to create these tiny little fragments, I wish there was a scale bar on here. Oh, there is a scale, a scale bar. So those are centimeters. So in order to create these small fragments, he suggested that these must come from a much bigger body, perhaps kind of akin to the kind of sizes that we see um, on Earth, or, or perhaps even much bigger. And so he was the first one to kind of postulate, along with um, another um, uh, professor of the time, I forget his first name, but Smith is his surname, um, that perhaps the moon was at one point, very early on its, in its history, um, like a, um, had large portions um, of its uh, body molten, so that you could actually create a crust of this material um, called anorthosite, which is just means it's made up of mostly anorthite, this feldspar mineral. And so he was, they were really the first people to propose the idea of what's called a lunar magma ocean, um, whereby the moon started off kind of in this state, so either fully or mostly molten. Um, and as it crystallized, um, different minerals would have formed. And so the first minerals that would have formed, this is our magma ocean, we start creating magnesium-rich minerals like olivines and pyroxenes. As crystallization progresses, you start forming this, this mantle, which is dominated by these minerals. You reach a certain point, though, when to, at about 70 to 80% solidification of this magma ocean, where another mineral starts to crystallize. And that's the, uh, the anorthite that I was talking about. And this plagioclase is much lighter, it's, a, it's, a less, dense, it's less dense than the surrounding melt, this, this red depiction here. Um, and so it floats to the surface. And so this um, process is a means by creating uh, a crust that is dominated by a particular type of mineral. Um, and this is our, what's called a flotation crust on uh, the surface of the moon. And again, as early as 1970, and the samples were only returned a year earlier, and this was a paradigm-shifting idea that came from essentially one sample from Apollo 11. Um, and so as crystallization progressed, the final kind of gasps of this lunar magma ocean would have been dominated by elements that don't really go into the minerals that had already crystallized, so the olivines and pyroxenes, and also the anorthite. And so we call those incompatible elements, so things like potassium, rare earth elements, phosphorus, volatiles, and also iron and titanium minerals. And iron and titanium minerals, like ilmenite, are much denser than olivine and pyroxene. And so it's thought that these minerals and this layering, if it happened exactly like this, that's debated, but would have created some kind of gravitational instability because you've got more dense material on top of less dense material. And so it's thought that some period after this, there would have been some reorganization or hybridization of the mantle whereby those more dense materials kind of sank through um, the, the previously formed mantle cumulates. And so an important acronym that I forgot to mention that you should know is CREEP. Um, and that's just that acronym for uh, the potassium rare earth elements of phosphorus. And so those samples really changed our understanding of the evolution of the moon. And some parts of what I just told you are still debated um, and are changing. But for the most part, this is the most prominent way by which we think the moon formed um, and by which the moon evolved. <coughs> 
after it had accreted. And so the question is, though, what does this look like in the sample collection? What do we have that shows us this process occur? Well, I've shown you already the soils, the little fragments of anorthite in the soils. Um, as you look up at the moon, you see two different terrains. Um, and everyone can see this. We see these dark areas, the maria, and we also see the much lighter um, highlands uh, terrains. And um, the lunar crust is basically this highland material, we think, and it's much older than the maria. Um, and we think it's mostly composed of what we call primary crust, so the material formed by the lunar magma ocean, but then also during those first few hundred millions of years, also magmas that didn't quite make it to the surface but intruded that original crust. And that's what we call the secondary crust. And to get into specifics, a magnesium suite and alkali suite. Now the maria, um, as defined by basalt, but basaltic material that has been found both in meteorite samples, but also in the Apollo sample collection, um, and also from looking at remote sensing data, suggests that volcanic activity on the moon is, has actually been a very long, protracted uh, process. So potentially we have basalts on the moon that are 4.35 billion years old, and potentially have volcanic features on the surface that are as less as young as 100 million years old, which is mind-boggling. But the majority of samples that we have are around the 4, point, are around the four to 2.7 billion years old. And as I said, those are all volcanic, and their compositions um, vary quite substantially from containing a lot of this residual um, titanium-rich material um, to containing very low, uh, very low amounts of that titanium-rich material. And so this slide is just to illustrate that volcanic activity does happen on the moon, <laughs> in case you didn't believe me from all the volcanic rocks and all the evidence I just showed you. But if you think back to pre-Apollo days, you know, they, some people really thought that the moon wasn't differentiated, that it didn't have a core, a mantle, a crust, that, you know, it hadn't been through all these volcanic and magmatic processes. Um, but now we can actually see from the samples that not only do we have these volcanic rocks, we have things that look very similar to material thrown out of some volcanoes on Earth. Um, so these are, this is a pyroclastic deposit from Apollo 17, where you can clearly see the orange soil formed as uh, volcanic material was spewed out of um, a volcano. And basically, without there being much of an atmosphere on the moon, uh, anything that was thrown out, the molten droplets quenched and formed this beautiful orange soil um, and little glass beads that you see here. And so going back to kind of the outline of the talk, um, something switching gears a little, the Apollo era kind of dubbed the moon as being very dry. Um, and even though many samples were analyzed, it was very difficult using the technology of the day to determine if anything that was being measured was lunar or was it just terrestrial contamination. And so the Apollo era, and right up until the early, early 2000s, very late 1990s, it was kind of a bone dry place, there's no water, we're not very interested. Um, and lo and behold, um, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, we started finding water everywhere. So with advancements in technology, not just in the laboratory, but also in remote sensing techniques, we were able to find water on the surface of the moon and not just at the poles in permanently shadowed craters, but everywhere on the surface. Um, and there is a lot of variation in how much is actually there, and we can talk more about that in the question and answer later. Um, but just to say that going from somewhere that, you know, we weren't even talking about in situ resource utilization 15, 20 years ago, and now we're going back to the moon, and that's the one thing definitely people want to do, uh, as well as bring home samples, of course. More samples are always welcome. Um, but the other thing was we detected water unequivocally in lunar samples. So above detection limit levels of water, and we were also able to say something about its isotopic composition. And so I'm going to spend a bit of time now going through kind of what we've learned about lunar water in samples from laboratory analysis, because that's what I do, and that's what I'm going to continue to do. Um, 
And so a lot of you won't be familiar of how we do this. Um, and so as a sample scientist, I like to study samples, and I like to study them as they are, pretty much. So I take very thin slices, about 30 micron thick slices of rock. Here's one here. This is Apollo 12 sample, 12064. And you'll notice with a keen eye that this sample is not the same as the one I'm going to talk about in a second. It doesn't matter. Um, and so what we do is we look at the mineralogy. We look at what, what minerals are present in a rock. We look at the different textures. And we look at the grain size, so how big or small are the crystals. And we look at... Um, relationships between different uh, parts of the rock and also um, uh, between different assemblages of minerals throughout the, the rocks that we look at and between different rock samples. And we use a scanning electron microscope to kind of get a good handle on all those things. Um, but we can't measure the volatile contents. We can't measure water with that technique. And so we use this technique to not only uh, look at the textures of minerals, but also to identify minerals that we know might contain water. And so one mineral that I focus a lot on is the mineral called apatite, and it's a calcium phosphate that actually hosts water in its crystal structure. And so this was one of the minerals that wasn't really targeted during the Apollo era because we didn't have the technology to measure water in its crystal structure. But now we do. And so uh, not only in apatite, but in various other minerals too, olivines, plagioclase, and also in those lunar glass uh, beads that I showed you, the volcanic glasses. We've been using over the past decade, a bit more now, um, newly improved secondary ion mass spectrometers. Um, and all I want you to take away from that, it's a very loaded term, but we are able to make in situ measurements. So without chemically dissolving the rock or without combusting the rock, we're able to take a rock section and measure the volatile contents. Um, and most of what I do is look at water contents of different minerals and also look at the, the isotopic composition of that water. And so that's what we're going to focus on now. And so when we talk about uh, the isotopic composition of water and uh, with regards uh, to looking at these samples, I know not everyone's familiar with this, but um, here we go. Uh, when I talk about measuring water in situ, I'm talking about the water content. Uh, we don't always have water as H2O present in a crystal structure, but we use water because it's more easy for, for comparison between different data sets, different labs, different sample types. Um, so we're going to talk about water in part per million. And then the isotopic composition of water is displayed on the y-axis in all of the diagrams I'm going to show you from now on. And so what that is, is it's a measure of the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen in a sample versus the deuterium to hydrogen ratio in a standard, which we're calling standard mean ocean water, which has a value of zero. So it would lie along this line here, uh, just above this dotted line. And it's expressed in a per mil uh, notation. And so it's just a much more handy way of um, expressing the D to H ratio comparison between a sample and standard because these numbers aren't very intuitive um, to get a hold of. And so um, when I talk about the different isotopic ratios, um, anything that kind of lies up towards this end of the axis has a lot of deuterium, and anything that lies at this end of the axis has much more hydrogen. So we would call this depleted, and I tend to call this heavy, but not everyone likes that, that term. And so there's a lot going on on this slide, but we're going to walk through it. And so what we've been doing over the past few years is looking at the water content of that mineral appetite in lunar basalts. And so we've been taking basalts from lots of different missions. And this is a, lunar basalt, a basaltic lunar meteorite. Um, and measuring the water content and its hydrogen isotopic composition um, in that appetite. Um, all I want you to take away from this is that uh, we have two geochemically different types of basalts, so basalts that have more ilmenite in them, so those are the high titanium basalts and those that have less, the low titanium um, basalts. And you can see that there's a large spread, a large spread in the water content of this mineral that forms in these samples and also a huge spread in the delta D value. And just to orient you again, SMO, standard mean ocean water, is here. This is the composition of the bulk silicate earth 
and the range for Earth is basically between zero and maybe about here. That's the entire range we see on Earth. And then we see this huge range on the Moon. So when we started getting back this data, we were kind of confused, I'm like, oh, what's going on? So you have to come up with some kind of way of reasoning how this fractionation in isotopes can happen. Um, and the, I drew it like that on purpose because the easiest way to kind of reconcile uh, these values was to start with something that was Earth-like and see what would happen if we started to think about the different processes that could cr create this kind of fractionation. And so what we deduced, and by we I mean several different um, workers in different groups, that perhaps volatile loss during the eruption of these lavas onto the surface of the moon, perhaps volatile loss um, could be a way of doing that because the moon is a relatively reduced body. We see native iron in lots of lunar samples. Um, it has a lower oxygen fiasity than Earth. Perhaps we can uh, explain this fractionation in hydrogen isotopes by actually losing hydrogen gas, H2 gas, during the eruption process and the crystallization. And so if you do that, then basically what you're doing is you're losing the lighter hydrogen to, well, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, but losing it to space um, and enriching the melt that remains or the melt that then goes on to form the rock in deuterium. And so the rock is going to cool and as it cools, you're going to crystallize minerals like the apatite, which incorporates that very heavy deuterium to hydrogen ratio, that heavy delta D signature. And so perhaps some combination of volatile loss or degassing, as we call it, um, followed by some degree of crystallization can give you the uh, systematics of water and deuterium to hydrogen that we see in the samples. And so that was all well and good when we were looking at um, the samples, uh, like the Apollo 15 samples and the Apollo 12 samples in 2013-ish. Um, but we didn't have a sample that actually recorded this process. We didn't have anything that kind of li laid, laid along one of these degassing curves. And so it was all kind of hypothesis and speculation. We knew that these samples were losing volatiles because if I go back one slide, we see the product of that. We see these holes in the samples that indicates the gases have been lost from this lava as it's been cooling. However, we didn't see anything that lay along these kind of trajectories until one study which came about and actually did find. So this is the same figure again, but you can see that these points all clearly lie upon um, a line. And so this study by Tartes et al. was the first study and actually to date the only study that has been able to actually tie down mineralogy in the thin sections with texture, so actually work out which were the mineral, which were the appetites that were forming first versus which ones were forming last. And then measure the early ones, the middle ones, the late ones, tie the mineralogy, the textures to the isotopic compositions and find that the, the appetites that were in a textural and mineralogical setting that indicated they formed early had the least fractionated values and highest water contents. And the ones that formed later as indicated by the minerals around them, had the highest and highest D delta D and the lowest water. And so that was really an indication that, okay, maybe this process does happen and we're actually witnessing it in, in this sample. And so as part of my PhD thesis work, um, I took this a step further and wanted to really understand, okay, the basalts have been forming, and most of those rocks are about three million years old. Um, the ones that I just showed you the data for. What about samples that form much earlier? What about samples of that secondary crust? And so I studied um, this sample, 78235 and 76235. This is a, a troctolite, so it's made of um, olivine and uh, anorthite. And then this is a norite, which has basically pyroxene and anorthite. They're very old samples. And um, I did the same thing. I measured the water content and the delta D value. And the, the, I forgot to mention that the samples in this study by Tartes were creep-rich basalts. So they had a lot of those incompatible elements. And so those samples are here. And most of what I was looking at is in here. 
And so I'm just going to blow that up for you so you can see. Uh, so we're looking at less water um, in general and just focus for the moment on the magnesium sweep, so these green points. And so, as I said, these are ancient plutonic samples, intrusive rocks that formed more than 3.9 billion years ago. Uh, very, very ancient. And for the most part, these samples kind of have, except for some points over here, most of these uh, samples and data points are pretty consistent with each other. There's some scatter, but they, we don't see values way up here like we were seeing for the, the basalts. Um, and so we think that perhaps these samples, together with some of the creep-rich samples, uh, creep-rich analyses that maybe are the undegassed values, um, represent are the best candidates for what we call magmatic or indigenous lunar water. And so it's been suggested, we've suggested, that perhaps the interior of the moon uh, has a delta D value within this kind of range. And then as you basically process magma, magmas and uh, erupt them onto the surface via volcanic processes, that's how you fractionate um, the deut deuterium to hydrogen ratios. And there are other processes which maybe are doing the opposite, but I'm not gonna, men not gonna really talk about those. And so what you can clearly see from this is there's scatter um, but they overlap. All these values that we think might indicate the interior and indigenous signature of lunar water in the interior of the moon overlap with what we see for Earth. So the bulk silicate Earth, the interior of Earth, and also ocean water. And so the neat thing about looking at hydrogen isotopes is that the solar system, um, if we look at deuterium and hydrogen and we look at nitrogen isotopes, these isotope systems start to become very diagnostic of different types of planetary bodies. And so this is a complex diagram, but you can clearly see here, this bar represents that range I just showed you for the lunar interior. You can see that it overlaps with certain types of objects. So it, as I mentioned, it overlaps with Earth's mantle. It overlaps with um, the asteroid 4 Vesta, which is sampled by Eucrites. Um, it also overlaps with some values that we've been getting from Martian meteorites, so potentially there is similarity in the water and the isotopic signature of water in multiple bodies from the inner solar system. And it, over <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. And it also overlaps with um, carbonaceous chondrites, so some wet, very water-rich, primitive carbonaceous materials. And you can see clearly that it's very different from Oort cloud comets. And so we can use the hydrogen isotopic compositions that we measure in the lab from samples that we've had on Earth for 50 years using new techniques and say something about the origin of water in a body that formed four and a half billion years ago. Pretty cool stuff, I would say. But, and so the question then is, well, where did it come from? It's in the moon now, we see it in the samples, where did it come from? And so really at this point, the jury's out as to exactly when it was accreted to the Earth, but there's a time window that we think it, water was delivered to the interior. And it's somewhere between the formation of the moon via a giant impact of some description and the closure of the moon uh, via the solidification of the magma ocean. Basically, bef by the time the crust becomes significantly thick, it's very hard to penetrate and get anything into the interior. And so this window of time is pretty much when we think water getting into the source regions for the Mari basalts in the source regions to then be incorporated into rocks of the secondary crust. We think it's during this time window that these were mostly, um, that this was mostly possible. And just to uh, give you some orientation with regards to the solar system formation, we're not talking about within the first few million years of solar system history. We're talking the first couple of hundred millions of years of solar system history. And so I hope I've proved to you, I don't know how long I've taken to get to this point. Oh good, we're halfway through. So perfect. Um, I hope I've convinced you that lunar samples really are the gift that keeps on giving and are really an invaluable record for understanding the formation and evolution of the moon. And really when you think about pre-Apollo and post-Apollo views are really um, 
just invaluable for understanding um, not only the moon, but other places in the solar system as well. Because material has been continuously added to the moon um, since it was formed. And I'm not really going to talk about the surface samples and the, the breaches, but I did mention they were formed by impacts, and it's not just lunar material that we find in there. Um, and I'll leave you with that tantalizing hook. And now I'm going to uh, uh, move on to specially curated, unstudied Apollo samples. So all the samples that were on the previous slide um, have been studied or are actively being studied and are available for, for study. And they're mostly stored, well, they're all stored in nitrogen, pure nitrogen cabinets. And don't, they're all stored in the same way. They all come into contact with the same materials. Um, and they're processed. And if someone wants to study them, they can apply to study them. However, there are a group of samples which, for which that's not the case. And they've basically been locked up or locked away. That's a nicer term. They've been locked away since 1973 and have not been studied. Some of them have not even been opened. So uh, this sample here is a core sample from Apollo 17. It's vacuum sealed. And that seal has not been broken since it was sealed on the moon. And so it's not even been x-rayed. Like, we have no idea what's in there. It's, it's, it's great. Um, and there are two other samples like that. I'll explain a bit more if I have time later on about that, uh, those types of samples. Um, we also have samples that are stored in helium. So these samples were brought back they were opened in a helium purged glove box and were subsampled. And then the, some of the subsamples were then stored in helium and have been that way and continuously stored since, since they were uh, subsampled. And then there are other parts of the subsamples that have been stored conventionally. So you have this nice suite of samples that some have been stored in helium, some haven't. Um, a comparison study is beckoning. And so I'll get more onto that. And then you've got a subsuite, subset of samples that have been frozen. Um, oh, what happened? Did anything change? No. There we go. And then you have a subset of samples that have been frozen. So again, these samples weren't frozen necessarily on the moon. They were brought back. They were photographed. So an example of one is here. This is a rock sample from Apollo 17. And these are all from Apollo 17, by the way, all the frozen samples. And they were brought back, studied a little bit. And by studied, I mean they were photographed a little bit. And then they were put in stainless steel vials, in Teflon bags, in stainless steel bolted containers, and put in a freezer since 1973. And they haven't been studied. And so. Be it being the 50th anniversary, I guess, and you know this new wave of lunar science and new technology that's available to us, NASA fortunately had the foresight to uh, store all of these samples away under different conditions. And it was uh, last year that they um, announced to the community that there was an opportunity to study these samples using new technologies. Um, but the caveat, or the, I guess, condition was that it had to be, they had to be studies that couldn't be conducted on the samples that were already available. They had to be unique to the samples um, and had to be, in some way, you can imagine, related to the way they were stored. And so this uh, program is called the Apollo Next Generation Sample Analysis because we're in the next generation of sample analysis. We've got new techniques, new technologies, new ways of doing things that weren't available uh, 50 years ago. And so we have been fortunate enough here at LPL to be one of the selected teams, and we will be studying uh, the frozen rock sample that was brought back, 71036. And I would have liked this talk to be more about where we're at at the moment with regards to the pro program, but we haven't got our sample yet, so we're still waiting with bated breath. Um, but hopefully I'll be able to tell you more about our actual results in the future. Um, but I'm going to tell you what we plan to do. Um, and then some exciting developments since uh, we were selected. Um, and so I forgot to mention that these samples have been frozen at minus 20 degrees C. Um, different soil samples have been um, uh, stored frozen, and then also this rock sample. 
And so we elected to study this rock sample, 71036, which is from the Apollo 17 mission, as denoted by the 7. And this is a lunar reconnaissance orbiter map of uh, the Apollo 7, part of the Apollo 17 landing and traverse um, site map. And so you can see, hang on, I can't see it. Oh, there it is. You can see the landing module is here, the flag is here, and station one is where our sample was collected on the rim of this crater called Steno Crater and this smaller, I guess, secondary crater. And so uh, this is an image before sampling of uh, where the samples were taken at station 1A by an astronaut, um, it's crazy, on the moon. And uh, these samples, I get, see, I get giddy and like, I've been doing this for a while. Um, and these samples were collected from this boulder um, at the Apollo 17 station one site. And here's our frozen sample. And it was collected with three other samples that have not been frozen. So collected from the same boulder, we have a set of four samples um, that were all collected together. One has been specially curated and the other ones have not. And so what we decided to do as part of our study is compare the frozen sample, 71036, with these other um, four samples uh, that have varying masses. Uh, those are the, the original masses. They've gone down a little bit, except for this one, which remains 100% pristine because it's been frozen. OK. And so I've called these, these basalts the steno crater basalts because they were collected from the edge of that that beautiful little crater. And so these basalts are uh, fine to medium grained. They're vuggy. They've got lots of those vesicles and uh, pore spaces, which kind of indicate to us that they've lost gases as they've been erupted onto the lunar surface. Um, and they're high titanium basalts. Um, as I said, they're all vesicular, but they have varying vesicularity, as can be seen from photographs. So none of these samples have been sort of x-ray imaged or anything. We have no idea what the interior distribution of vesicles and bugs looks like. And as noted in some of the earlier work and the initial characterization, so just the photographs, you can clearly see minerals that uh, crystallize from the outside of these um, bugs and void spaces into the middle, uh, which is super interesting. Um, the samples themselves contain a whole host of different types of minerals and uh, really just wanted to point out that they contain apatite. So that's the mineral that I basically study and uh, look at. But part of the team um, are uh, other collaborators who will be looking at the other minerals in there as well. So um, our group will be looking at uh, very, very late stage glasses. So as these rocks crystallize on the surface, the very, very last thing to form basically quenches and forms a glass. And so we're going to be studying the glass the appetite, and we're also going to be studying any melt inclusions, any trapped pockets of melt um, as basically the main minerals in the sample we're forming. Another group are going within our another person within our group are going to be studying more of the pyroxenes and any olivines that we find in the samples. Um, and that's just kind of a tangent, because I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> uh, just to mention that, that, that those minerals exist in the samples. These samples don't, are not, their ages are not well constrained. One of the samples, 71055, has a um, crystallization age of about 3.6 billion years old, but we don't know what the ages of the other samples are. It's possible they're all from the same lava flow, but we don't know until we, we date them. We also have no idea of what the exposure, I can, hope you can see in my computer's not blocking that. We also have no idea what the exposure age of these samples are. We don't know how long that boulder um, or outcrop, it's a, it's a boulder, but we have no idea how long the boulder or the outcrop from which it came were exposed at the lunar surface. And that's super important to know. Um, we currently have no information on that. And so before we get into kind of what we want to do, there has to be a first step. This is an unstudied sample, and so we need some way of uh, non-destructively documenting what's there, so taking more high-resolution photographs before we start doing anything. Um, we need to also potentially X-ray scan this sample to know what the interior distribution of um, these void spaces you can see here are. Um, we need to determine what's there. <laughs> 
Um, and then we need a mechanism for subsampling and taking the samples so that we can then study them in the lab. And so at the moment, this, this image is probably a few months old now. This is a, um, a nitrogen glove cabinet. The, these are the holes where the gloves would go. This part is missing. Um, and so this glove, um, nitrogen purge glove box, will be inside a minus 20 walk-in freezer at NASA's Johnson Space Center, where it will be initially studied and then broken apart and processed so that we can then get our sample. And so all of this um, initial work, which does involve some sample processing, is called preliminary examination. And we're going to be involved in um, actually looking at this sample for the first time. We just don't know when. It's going to happen. We just don't know when. Um, and so the objectives of our study are kind of fourfold. And so I mentioned that we're comparing a frozen sample with unfrozen samples. It seemed like a natural thing to do um, when we looked at the call. And so we want to compare the isotopic composition of water and the abundance of that water in different minerals and, and glasses between the, the four different basalts. So between specially curated frozen and conventionally stored samples. We also want to look at how different sample preparation techniques can influence, or maybe they don't influence, uh, the amount of volatiles and its isotopic composition as measured between the different samples. Ultimately, we want to determine the volatile loss history of the, the basalts and what that means for the Apollo 17 site and its evolution, and to define the eruption ages and exposure ages for these basalts. So we want to do a two-pronged approach where we want to look at the effects of curation activities that were basically created in the Apollo era 50 years ago, see how well, or how well they've held up, um, and see if we need to make any uh, tweaks to that. Um, and then also, really for the first time, thoroughly characterize the volatile evolution, the mineralogy, the textures, and the ages, all coordinated um, in a set of uh, lunar basalts. And so we kind of broke this down into several different research tasks. And the first is to, as I said, look at the textural, geochemical, and isotopic um, compositions and, and um, make analyses of water-bearing minerals and glasses within these samples from minerals that we know crystallize really early on and don't contain much water to those very late-stage glasses. And then even look at the minerals that have been forming inside the vesicles, which are forming at the very last stages when... Uh, or at least when these uh, basalts, we know we're losing gases. We also want to better understand in 3D how um, the vugs and vesicles are distributed within the samples. We don't have any 3D information, and that's really important for understanding the vesiculation history, the volatile loss history, and also understanding we end up with a really tiny, very tiny slice of the larger material. Um, so the bit that was, was knocked off. We end up in the lab with a very tiny piece. We want to know kind of as, as large a scale as we can, which is the hand specimen, we want to know what that looks like in 3D in terms of mineralogy and also bugs and vesicles. And then, of course, the last thing we want to do is do a really good job of the chronology. And so I've talked a lot today about water and isotopic composition and its importance for understanding geological processing on the moon, volatile loss, water, and also the origin of water and other volatiles in the solar system, but uh, we've been talking today about the moon. And so there were several reasons why this group of basalts were kind of attractive to us, and that's because the high titanium basalts in general have not been well studied for their volatile signatures, in part because this is a very new field. You know, the first water detection in a, in a basalt was only made in 2011, so we're still a pretty young field. Um, and so these red uh, diamonds represent all the data currently available for high titanium basalts. Um, as you can see, there's a large spread in the isotopic compositions, and we don't really know, because we have a lack of textual context, if that is indeed related to H2 loss. We think it is, but no one has done the detailed study like what Tartes et al. did on the Crete basalts. No one's done that for uh, high titanium basalts. And that's kind of uh, our motivation for this study, is to do that. 
And while we're doing that, while we're doing the hydrogen isotope composition, we're going to be obviously comparing differently prepared samples and also the warm or conventionally curated versus the frozen sample. So we kind of get uh, double the bang for our buck uh, with the, the first task. And then, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at the 3D distribution and uh, mineralogy of uh, the samples in their bulk specimens. And then if, if we're able to, we also want to look at um, any minerals that are projecting into those void spaces and potentially any coatings that have uh, been deposited within those, those voids and uh, vesicles as the lava has been cooling on the moon surface. And all of this is very fundamental to understanding how these samples were placed on the surface of the moon um, and, and ultimately for understanding the full evolution of each of the samples. And lastly, we want to, as I mentioned, only one sample has been dated and it was quite a while ago. And so we want to also get precise ages for these samples so we know when they formed and we can place them in the wider geological context of the moon and its evolution and also understand when these samples and how long have these samples been exposed to the harsh environment of space. And so what we want to and what we hope to be able to say at the end of the day and why we think this work is significant is because we want to evaluate, evaluate Apollo era curation practices. Um, we have a frozen sample and several conventionally stored samples, and we just have an opportunity to study the differences and similarities between them. If at the end of the day we find that curation practices and sample preparation techniques have no effect on what we measure in the samples, that's really important to know because no one has ever done this study before on a sample set that's been available for 50 years, and so this is really an invaluable um, question and thing to go after, even if it comes up with a null result. Um, we're going to be able to obtain a really precise and really detailed magmatic and post-magmatic history of these samples, which will be the first such detailed, coordinated approach um, for a suite of very, geochem we think, geochemically similar basalts. Remember, we don't actually know the chemistry of the frozen sample because it hasn't been studied. And ultimately, we'll uh, learn about the, the full geochemical history of the samples. And so, hang on a second. OK. Oh, I don't really have time. I'm going to leave you with a video. Um, if you want to ask me uh, anything, I've got lots of backup slides <laughs> in preparation. I'm going to see if this works, because I want to leave you with Stay tuned. And here are the astronauts actually chipping our samples off the boulder at Apollo Station 1. Oh, you can't see it. Oh, my goodness. No. No, that's too tight. Let me get that other boat. Okay, back. 476. This boat's still here. Is the rock sample with a little bit of a file near it. Okay, I promise it's happening. Chip off the rock. I'm going to turn my screen. And it's the. Can everyone see? No, you can't. It's happening. I promise they're doing it. So. With that, I'll take any questions. And the other chip. It's okay. <laughs> they can kind of see it. <laughs> Do you want to come down and we'll play it during the Q&A? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Got it. Okay. I'll mute it. Okay. Now, you think you can chip off the uh, other... Bert, can okay. you try and get it on the to play in the background? Okay, so we do have time for a few questions. Do you have a microphone there? A couple of technical issues. I noticed on your uh, charts that on your isotope charts that tritium was uh, the tritium was at conspicuous by its absence. Is uh -huh. there a reason for that? Um, I've never tried to measure tritium, and so usually when we're talking about water and heavy water and talking about trying to distinguish different. Um, uh, signatures for, for water. It's usually the de deuterium to hydrogen ratio. I've never heard anyone talking about tritium, and I imagine it's very hard to measure uh, with our current techniques um, because it's, there's not a lot there. <laughs> and so it's, we have a hard enough time measuring deuterium sometimes, um, which you could probably deduce by the different sizes in the error bars that were on most of those plots. Uh, when you're getting down to low water contents and also the very low D to H ratios, 
yeah, it gets really tricky even to measure deuterium. So I don't think tritium is on our radar. Other questions? Uh, maybe I missed it. I don't know. Um, I was just wondering why those uh, samples were kept for so long without being allowed to like, be studied. That's a great question. Um, basically, NASA just had the foresight that some of these samples should be stored away because they envisaged that the technology of the day wouldn't be all that it was going to be. You know, they foresaw that technology was going to improve and we would be able to, we would be capable either now or even further in the future, of doing work that wasn't possible in the day. And so whether it was the anniversary celebration or the renewed interest in going back to the moon um, from a, a government point of view, you know, uh, a lot of people are excited now about the moon and so this is just one more thing. And we have the technology now to do super duper things we couldn't have done or even dreamed about in, in the 70s. Does your study on the different curation storage techniques mm -hmm. have bearing on the next time we go back to collect new samples? Great in question. Four years? Great question. And I was getting carried away, and I forgot to mention that. But that, that's the idea. You know, if we do see differences, or we can, you know, say something that, you know, perhaps everything needs to be frozen, or, you know, say something like that it will have to be taken into account and we're thinking even in relation to OSIRIS for examples, you know, we want to preserve volatiles in their condition, we want to make sure what we're measuring is lunar um, and so if there is any uh, discrepancy we'll have a, a conversation about that. Um, yeah, thank you. And if there's not, we know we don't have to spend money to... Exactly and that's the upside, that's why a null result would, would be great because, you know, no one's done the study before, we don't know the answer to that question, so yeah. <laughs> uh, how do they um, determine uh, which, like, like, where they take the samples, like, which boulders, like, where on the ground, like, where, how do they determine which rocks to take samples from? That's a really good question. And as far as I know, it wasn't as well defined back in the Apollo era as it would be today. Like, today we have the resolution and imagery where we can even tell boulder tracks. We can tell where on a crater or where on a, um, you know, a hill or a mountain a certain boulder came from. That resolution wasn't available in uh, the Apollo days. And so whether they knew exactly which rock to go to, and I know a lot of the sampling, oppor sampling that was done was opportunistic. Like you may have heard about Apollo 15 seatbelt rock and, and that kind of thing. You know, some of these things were just done on the fly and they saw something of interest and went and picked it up or, you know, the orange soil. They didn't see that from orbit. They didn't know it was there. And so it was something new and something interesting. I think you should explain the seatbelt rock. Oh, really? <laughs> I've actually forgotten which one seatbelt rock is, which is very embarrassing. <laughs> well, but the, but the basic story was that they'd been told that they were done. Oh, there. yes, sorry. Yes, so they've been told you're done, your lunar uh, extravehicular activity is done for the day, and they're driving back, Apollo 15, they're driving back to the module, and a really interesting rock, I think it was one of the 15, was it 15556? I think it was 15556, was, and I may be wrong, uh, we'll look it up after. Uh, <laughs> they saw that on, Dave Scott saw that on the drive back, and said, oh, Houston, we need to stop. I've got a problem with my seatbelt. And it was a complete lie, a complete lie. He just wanted to go and grab this rock and put it in his pocket and didn't say anything until they got back. So opportun opportunities came when they just did things that were not pre-described. They didn't know they were gonna collect that sample. And so, yeah, okay. wing it. Um, after you get your uh, samples, do you have a feeling for how long the analysis that you've explained today in the series of processes that you have to go through, how long that might take? Uh, yes, we do. So we had proposed to do this study, the complete study, in three years. And it'll probably still take that time. Um, our start date has just been pushed back. And that's because we're not the only team that was selected, right? We are, this is not the only sa unstudied sample that is being released for study. And so uh, really the holdup, if you can even call it that, is that 
uh, we're preparing to open one of the core samples, which I didn't really talk about, but we're preparing to do that as a massive consortium. And because these cores have never been studied, never been opened, we don't even know what they really look like. And so the preliminary examination process takes a much longer time, and it involves all the lunar curators at NASA. And so the lunar curators can't be in two places at once. And so that's the priority at the moment, is to get one of those core samples opened. And we're going to start, myself and uh, one of my students, Zoe, are going to be going to NASA to help out with that. And we'll be really the first people looking at these samples, documenting what's there. And then whenever we can, we'll get our sample. But the good thing is we can start studying as early as probably next month the unfrozen samples because those are available for study. And so our work will start, but we won't get the frozen sample for a while yet. And we're okay with that. So. Okay. Um, we maybe have time for one last question. Or, since uh, we are past the hour, let's thank Dr. Barnes again. Thank you.